Remy, thank you very much for talking to me. I much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm also keen to have this conversation with you. It's it's nice to be able to talk to people about books and art in this strange time when we're relying on them to get to get us through these tough times. Absolutely. And first of all, I adored your book. I thought it was just stunning. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. I really appreciate hearing that. Uh, I live in Vintok uh, uh, in Namibia, and we're not the biggest reading community, so it's always shocking when someone from outside says, I read your work and I enjoyed it. And it's, it always, always makes me feel a flutter in the heart. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, let's start with this. So for those people who haven't read your book, what is it about? Yeah. Uh, the story follows a young man, Seraphin, who is a Rwandan who has migrated from Rwanda and, and moved to Nairobi first, and then he's then settled in Vintuk with his family. And it explores him over the course of his final year in law school. It delves into his past and present, basically explaining his origin story. So at varying parts of the story, it can be classified as a coming of age story because Parts do parts of his teenage life are explored, and his you know his primary his primary school years, his high school years are explored. But in in, in that time, it also explores the the complex origins of his migration. So it delves into some historic aspect of Rwanda pre and post 1994, Vintuk in the present, and then also a big chunk of the story takes place in Cape Town in South Africa, where. Uh, Seraphin goes to study and then he just basically tries to map out his past trajectory in academia at a, one of the most prestigious universities in the country. So that's what it is. It is part origin story, part coming of age, and then a big chunk of it is migration. But I think for your listeners and whoever might be listening in South Africa, is this place is the story is very local in those ways. Yeah. Where did the yeah. idea come from? Oh. Yes, I'd like to say so many places, but to help make it clearer, I'll say I've always wanted to write the story, but I've never known how. And where it came from was I was reading a lot of uh, Zadie Smith's work and Chimamanda Adichie's work, and I was just interested in this idea of migration. But in all of those works, migration is always someone who leaves the global south and makes it to the global north or leaves Africa to head to the west. And so... It was weird for me to read all of these works because more African migrants wind up in other African countries. And I never felt like that narrative was explored enough. Or maybe it is I encountered the right literature. I do leave space for that contradiction that I hadn't encountered the right works. But it was also a, a desire for me to finally pursue this thing that I had always wanted to do since I was young and I was never allowed to, I didn't have the opportunity. And then I finally committed. And this was the idea that was strongest in my head. And because it was the strongest, really fought and drowned out all others. And then I could commit easily to it because it was, it was, it was the one that I wanted to run with. Yeah. 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 Um, talk to me about how much of yourself is in this book? <laughs> the, the question that, that all authors and writers fear. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me try and give you an interesting answer. So I'll say that all and none of myself are in the book. And the reason I say that is because when you start creating the process of creating any art, there's what I think is an artistic veil that comes between you and the subject you're working on. And now through that veil, the reader interacts with the thing regardless of who you are behind it, who you might be. So it's not that you are the one in the work itself, but the work was made by you. And then I'll also say that some of it is, some of me is in the book because it is very impossible to create art without a subject, without some soul in it. And I think you can get an idea of what like soulless work or like soulless art is. I think some part of the of the creator gets put in. And then the last leg of that answer is, I leave that to the reader to decide uh, because, you know, even, let me, let me phrase it this way. Even when God wanted to make people, he had to look towards himself. So I don't think writers are necessarily unique in that way. 
if they look towards themselves as an act of creation. But it is also like a parent and a child. That, that child is half you, half someone else, but at the same time, not you at all. So does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's the best I can answer that question. Thanks. So uh, the plight of the refugee features quite prominently in the book. Yeah. Um, in fact, some of the people who come from Rwanda and settle in Namibia say, uh, interestingly enough, that black people who come to Namibia are described as foreigners, whereas white people are described as expats. So uh, what made you explore this theme and just maybe um, tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, yeah. So the dynamics here in Namibia are also quite, quite similar to the dynamics in a lot of Southern African countries. Sadek seems to have this problem. Um, and the reason why I explore this is that for a very long time, I lived in Namibia, even longer than I've been, than I lived in my native country of birth. So there was this weird dissonance between how long I'd been in Namibia and how long I'd been from the country where I was. And then there was a time when I, my time in Namibia exceeded my time in Rwanda. And then I started feeling like, wait, I'm probably in Namibia now. And immediately you're told, no, 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 you're not, you're not Namibia. You're definitely Rwandan because your passport says this and because you're from here and you are a foreigner. Uh, and our Department of Home Affairs at the time <laughs> had this interesting line for, they said, foreign nationals and aliens and I remember whenever you had to go apply for your for your residence permit or anything at the home affairs, I'd have to stand in this line and think about like foreign nationals and aliens. And I'm like, my gosh, what are aliens? Like is Clark Kent going to come and sign up for his work permit over here or something of the sort? Um, and the reason why I wound up exploring it in that narrative was because this is the barrier that is placed between all black Africans, when they migrate to another country, they're always treated as the other. You are a Zimbabwean, you are a Zambian, you are an Angolan, you are X, Y, Z, and the other. But if you are from the global north or the west, these barriers do not apply to you. And we, and politically, socially, and economically speaking, we all understand what is the difference between a foreigner and an expat, because an expat is a term that can only apply to white people who live in Africa or who are working in Africa. They're the owners who can call them expats. But I fail to see what the difference is between them and a Ghanaian working in South Africa. They're both expats, but we only apply this to Americans or British or Germans or French living in our countries. And so for me, in addressing this in the eternal order and so on, it was important to bring these distinctions to the forefront because they really do affect the way people live on the ground. I don't think, for example, that anyone is better than anybody, but we apply these labels to them that actively differentiate them in society and give them different economic chances and social opportunities and acceptance and all of those kinds of things. And so over here in Vintuk, it's a problem that we have. We are very, very good at spotting foreigners and foreigners almost always seem to be from our our surrounding Sade countries. But foreigner does not apply to South Africans. It does not apply to white Germans. It does not apply to white Europeans. It does not apply to Americans. But if you're from Angola, Zim, Zam, Moz, Lesotho, Swaziland, ah, you are a foreigner, but nowhere else. And so for me, it's exploring these types of narratives that I think is important in my work because migration is a normal experience. That's what I, I think I'm trying to get. It is normal. It is normal for people to move from place to place in search of work, in search of better opportunities, and in search of love. Um, moving your house from one side of Cape Town to another is migration because you're moving from one community to another. That's normal. It's not something that is, that is to be treated differently or badly. And moving from one country to another, especially when your country is in plight and you move to another, I think there's no greater compliment than a host nation can get than when people look at their country and they say, look, our house is not in order, but yours is. Can we stay? I think that's a compliment to you and your house that you're able to run it, maintain it, manage it, all of those things, rather than mm -mm, mm -mm, we don't need you in our house or that type of thing. I think, I think there's 
status of being a refugee should drastically be rethought or being a migrant should be rethought because nobody leaves home unless it's bad. Nobody, nobody does that. And so when they do, it's probably because it's bad. And if they wind up in your place, it's probably because yours is better. And so thinking along those lines, I think is important when we when we phrase conversations around uh, refugeehood, migration, and you know just human movement because we all have to move at some point. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the concept of family also features very highly in your book. Um, in fact, you write that family is something to be survived. So. <laughs> <laughs> about oh that. gosh. Oh, gosh, Andrea, man, what family does not have to be survived on Earth? Like, f family is like the most, one of the most important building blocks in society, and it is also simultaneously the most dysfunctional, like, unit of organization. It is so dysfunctional, it is crazy. The reason why the character says that, like, it is something that has to be survived, is because when you are in that strange middle period between let's say, I think 18 and 25, when all you want to do is break out of your family mold, that is that stage when we say you need to survive your family. That's when consequences of your primary and high school education start coming to the fore. That's when you're no longer a teenager and you're expected to become an adult in the world. That's when you start bearing the consequences of how you are raised. And that's, I think, is when you need to start surviving your family because family comes with its own gifts and curses. So it is on the one hand very nice to have loving and supporting parents. It is quite another to have to deal with their expectations. If it comes to what you must do, where you must live, who you must love, those types of things. That's what we mean by surviving your family. Differentiating your own identity from the family unit because that's what families can sometimes be. Coercive things that force you to conform. And so in the novel, Seraphine is really trying to break out of his family, not because he doesn't love them, but because he doesn't want what they want. He wants something different. And when you face the circumstances that he has, living in Vintuk uh, with scarce opportunities for the youth and, you know, constantly being bombarded with these messages, the world is out there, the world is out there, the world isn't here. It is very easy to understand why a child raised around messages like that wants to break out of the mold and why it feels, for example, that his family is the, one of the biggest constricting factors. And he's really held together, but there are two titanic forces in that family. The one in his mom, who is this larger-than-life personality who has this rich history behind her, and she has a particular expectation for her son. And then there's the hard-working, quiet father, who also has particular expectations. Then there's the Rwandan diaspora in Namibia. Then there's the status as a migrant or refugee in Namibia. All of those things really, really weigh heavily on this character. And so, and all of those things stem from family. But at the same time, the, it's counterbalanced by once you survive your family, once you get over their biases and prejudices, I think you learn to love them a lot more. And there's a, a nice, interesting age in your late 20s when you realize why your parents are the way they are or why you were raised this way or why your sister acts that way. And I think that's when family is really best, when the gifts of family, when everyone has now become an individual and you are able to appreciate each other's individuality even though you are one unit. And so it's, it balances out by saying that, you know, some family is something that you have to survive. But once you survived them, then you can, you almost certainly do love them because you're like, mom, I understand why you were like this to me when I was 17 and a half. You know, I understand why you told me to stay away from house parties. I understand what you're afraid of and yada, yada. And once you reach that stage as a family, man, things just become better between, I think, I think they become better. It, it's not always a perfect story, but I think generally they really do become better. The other thing that really struck me was the sense of the temporal time. So past versus present versus future. So uh, tell me more about that. Was that intentional? 
Ooh, Andrea, yo, you are asking all the very, very challenging and interesting questions. I'm going to lie to you and say, yes, I definitely intended every page and every temporal shift to be had to happen that way. Uh, and I'll say that knowing that it is a lie, and I hope that you know it's a lie. No, um, when you come, when you, when you, when you write a story, you have a general idea of what's going to happen, and then as soon as you get into the form or the format, particular things happen in the story that require to shift, and then you realize, oh, here we need some past, here we need some present, here we need to perhaps foreshadow the future. It's a feeling that you get during the art of creation, like a painter somehow intuitively knows there are enough brush strokes here, here make them, here do some etching, here more blue, here more red. So I think it's more intuition. But uh, to give you a nice literary answer that, you know, that would look well or sound well on a, on a panel, I'll say this, the Rwandan word for tomorrow and yesterday is the same. It's this word called ejo, E-J-O, ejo. So maybe in, in our consciousness, we don't think of yesterday and tomorrow as being different, but more as one constant shift of activity ongoing. Because depending on the context that you use that word, then you signify whether things happened yesterday or whether they are happening tomorrow. And then all you have is this present moment that is used to navigate those. I think and I hope in the story that that comes through, that what is the past is not always the past. It's actually always with you. And that what is the future really isn't something separate from what you have now. Like you're going to take this, you, me, our issues, our problems, whatever. We're going to take this forward. So there's no separate door in time that we walk through and then things are just perfect. We, we always bring ourselves. And also that even now, we're carrying things from when we were three. And so we are always carrying this thing with us continuously from past to present to, fu to, present to, to future. And I'm hoping that in some way that came through in the novel. I can't speak for everybody, but I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> No, it definitely came through for me. Definitely came through for me. Yeah. Um, I also want to ask you about your writing process because it's different yes. for each author. Uh, how do you go about constructing a novel? Oh, well, you know, I wake up early in the morning. I go for a walk. I write until five o'clock. And then in the evening, I smoke cigars and drink cognac and edit. I lie. My lighting process is nothing like that at all. It always starts with desperate panic. Uh, panic, I mean that um, sometimes I'm scared the ideas I want to tackle are too big and I don't have enough time. And that brings me to the idea of time when it comes to writing. My writing process is designed around the time that is available for it. So I do not have the luxury of fellowships, residencies, of not being able, of having limitless time to work on this thing. So I, fi I arrange my day in such a way that I can write. So I try to write in the mornings now because it is when it is quiet relatively, uh, when I know that I can leave my deadlines for the afternoon or writing work that I have. I prepared it last night, I'll attend to it. I prefer to write in the mornings when I'm fresher, when just the ideas I guess are more live. All of my writing starts as a draft on paper with pen because I think that medium forces you to cut to the chase of something and then from there, transfer it to the keyboard. Keyboard is really about the manual grunt work of typing something out. Once something has been typed, I'll read it. I'll give it, if again, if there is time, I will let it sit for a while. If there is no time, then, then I guess sometimes it has this rushed feel to it that I don't like. Um, and then even around this thing, I'm saying that writing in the morning, typing, drafting things on paper is dependent upon my economic circumstances so uh at the moment i am not i am not in the in the position where i can dedicate a lot of time to my writing because the coronavirus like with a lot of people has shrunk a lot of people's economic opportunities so i have to spend quite a chunk of my time looking for these opportunities for myself which has shrunk the time that i have to write this is not new for me it is 
a systemic issue that a lot of people are facing, not only here, but also in South Africa with so many magazines and publications going under. All writers everywhere are having to assess the way they create. They're having to redefine their processes. Um, and it is comforting in a way that I know I'm not struggling by myself because I can reach out to other people and ask them for help. Like, how do you approach this? How do you make time in this weird time, in this strange period of crisis? And people are just generous with their time and with their knowledge. They say, Remy, try and do this, shorten this, rather focus on that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's always, yeah, you shift with the times. Um, and, you know, everyone is a creator. How do you, how do you go about your thing, Andrea? <laughs> well, while I read, I make notes in pencil, not yeah. in the book. I, I take a piece of paper that I use as a bookmark and I just make notes on there in pencil yeah. as I along um, to yeah. refer back. So that's my process of reviewing a book. And then yeah. obviously maybe I do a little bit of research on the internet about the person yeah. or about the book. Um, and then I construct my questions that way. Yeah. 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 And, and how much, let me rephrase the question. How, how strenuous is your, reviewing and creative process on your person? Um, sometimes I find it difficult to put my notes into words, but I mean, I, I last year I finished my, my master's degree and that kind of taught me. Congratulations. How to, oh, thank you. Yeah. But that yeah. Me how to put the research part into properly constructed sentences. I mean, sometimes yeah. it, feels tedious but once it's done it feels really great and I'm sure it's yeah. the same for you like there are times yeah. where it just feels like the writing just lags or drags but once you've done it and you look back on it you're like yeah I did that yeah 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 I agree with you and I you know what I find more reward in the writings that are hard and challenging because I find that those those things engage all parts of you and when something is abstract and nebulous and really hard to put down on paper it, it forces you to bring all of yourself and the very best of you to the writing and i find those those hard pieces of writing like when you're like how am i going to transfer this bullet point that i noted down here to an act to an actual thought that's i think is often the best writing because that's when a writer is like fully engaged I think there's something to be said about easy writing. When something feels too easy, I think you're taking it for granted. And it's probably not going to last. I, it's, a, it's a hunch I have. Just a hunch. Yeah. And then uh, what's next for you? Are you thinking of the next novel or what is it that you see in the future? Oh, man. In the future, I am going to do so many push-ups so I can show up in the next Black Panther film. I just want to be... <laughs> I just want to be Wakandan 52. I don't need speaking lines. I can die in the first five minutes. I just want to be in the frame. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> what is next for me is I would like in an ideal world, I would say this, in an ideal world, which is one without Corona, which is one without, you know, all of these economic anxieties, is I want to have the time to work and compile a short story collection because those things take time. And then obviously while you're working on the short story collection, you're trying to work on a longer, dreaming, thinking, planning about a longer piece of work, either fiction or nonfiction. This is not an ideal world, so we are moving things around as best as we can. Every creator is moving chess pieces around with the resources that's available to them. So I am lucky that I have some short stories completed, some of them have been published, some of them are available. And now my goal is to figure out how to cook them into like a soup that I can present to the world. I'm also going into editing again for the eternal audience of one since it got picked up by Scout Press in the US. So the production of that international version is interesting because I don't know many writers who have the luxury of having their second book be their first book as well. So that's going back into the editing process, which I really love. I, I love being pushed as a writer. I love working with editors and, you know, trying to be made better in some way. So that's what I'm going into. And then long term, ah, girl, like, I mean, I want to, you see that box set behind you that says Buffy. I mean, like, I feel like there should be a box set that says, that's called the eternal audience of one. Like, we should turn this thing into like a, a film or a series or something. 
something. But you never know what the future holds. You always stay positive. You always try to do your best. Um, but I'll say this about my work. I hope I hope that in future my work is able to come out in a safer, calmer, more equitable world because this present moment is challenging for everybody. And so it is also hoped that whatever it is that comes out later, it meets it comes out in a different world. And that for me speaks to the work that we all have to do right now to try and get there. So, I mean, you could have this one, you, Andrea, could have this wonderful, wonderful story, but the world could be in such a state that publishing has stopped completely. And that, that is just scary. And I think we all need to work hard to make sure that our world, our future world, is ready for the stories that, that we need to tell and write then. Yeah. Finally, I want to ask you about the title of the book, The Eternal Audience of One. Um, I, you know, you don't have to give the story away, but what is it yeah, referring yeah. to? In the novel, uh, Seraphine uses the line to explain that, hey, you know, who knows what the future is? Who knows what the past is? I guess you just do your best and hope because, you know, at the end of the day, you're the eternal audience of one. Uh, and he uses it in, a, in an essay that he uses to apply for university. And it's the winning essay that eventually gets him a scholarship to go study at university. And so it really plays on this idea of the Shakespearean conception of life, that all of the world is a stage. And throughout this life, you are various people. You are a baby, you're a boy, you're a teenager, you're a man. You're an old man, and then you're dead. This is Spanish Shakespearean like trajectory of life, as he explains it, uh, as Seraphine encounters it in 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 the essay. And so, but then if you're on the stage, who is watching? If all the world is a stage, who's the audience? I've I've always wondered about that. Who who's watching? Are you watching yourself go through life? Is someone else watching you go through life? It's it's not a question that I've, ne I've, I've, I've been able to answer. And so calling it the eternal audience of one, it's like a, it's like a, a name drop and a, res and, a, and, and a show of respect, like Shakespeare and Shakespeare's concept of, of like all the world's a stage. But if there's a stage, there has to be an audience. And who is this audience? And so in the novel, I think there's so many answers to who this potential audience is. And I leave... I try to leave that to the reader to decide. Who do you think it is? Well, I'm sure that's a difficult question, which is why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, I, I suppose it could be various people. Like, for example, I think your parents do watch you go through life. Um, uh, you know, if, if you're close to them, but I think they do, do sort of closely watch you. Um, but I, other than that, I think it's important to try and watch yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I think, isn't that what this moment, present world moment, is asking for? Like self-reflection about who we are, what we do, what we did, what we want to do. It's, I mean, who knows the truth about anything except you because you're the one going through this world. Nobody who really knows whether you're a good person or not. Only you can know. And I think maybe that's what what this present moment asks us to do to realize that you know we need to watch ourselves not out of fear you know not out of fear not out of self-hate but i mean i think about myself during the course of my day and there's some stuff that i do it's just like wow i mean that's weird but it's also funny and you're like but also hella weird dude and you know it's not it's not self-flagellation it's just acknowledging like the complexity of our lives and you know, thinking about these things, I think it's important. When we go through our day, who do we say hello to? How do we say hi? Why do we not say hello to other people? And when these are things that I guess I think about before I go to bed, when I wake up, like if I'm sitting listening to music. And I mean, I think, I'm thinking about it right now, like the eternal audience of one. I mean, I don't know whether it was prophecy that you and I would have the Skype conversation in the year of coronavirus and our Lord 2020. I mean... Who would have thought about it? But now I'm thinking about it. And you're asking me, who's the eternal audience of one? <sighs> I don't know. Is it me? Is it you? Or is it the people who are going to see this video? It's, it's an interesting 
It's an interesting question that I have no way of answering. So, yeah. <laughs> I think that's perfect because I think you're right. I think the reader should decide for him or herself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what... Isn't that what all reading is? You're, you're being asked... You're being presented a set of stories or facts or whatever. And it is hoped that you're being given enough information to make a judgment call by yourself based, of course, on your prior reading, on your life expectancy, on not life expectancy, life experience. And it's a sense of trust to be able to decide for yourself because that's what freedom is, isn't it? I don't want to tell you this is, let's look behind you. This is Buffy, the collection, and say, this is what this is about. No, you want to be able to decide whether you like Buffy or whether you're on Angel side. I personally think Spike is the greatest vampire in the history of the known universe. So, you know, I, I don't want to, these are not questions that I want to be forced to decide upon by the creator. And uh, I'm, I can't say that I am, I have figured all of it out. It's just something that I've learned from myself that Andrea is going to experience this thing in a fundamentally different way from the way I created it, from the way my wife experiences it, from the way my father experiences it, from the way my friends experience it. And you just need to let go because I think it's that diversity of experience that makes the world the world. We can't all be the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Remy, thank you so much for talking to me. This was delightful. I really loved yeah. it. No, no, it was a pleasure, Andrea, and thank you for making the time and effort uh, to just have this conversation with me as well, making the space available for me. Uh, it's an important platform for writers to have to just be engaged with. Stories are important things to engage with right now because they are all that is holding us together right now. The world is tense. It is a scary place. It is a hard place. And right now, only stories about common humanity or, you know, the world beyond this one, not the, not the spiritual, but the world that is to come, the good world that we're trying to build in the days to come. Those are, those stories are the ones that are like giving people hope right now because it is a scary, scary place right now. I'm, I've never lived in these types of times uh, and, and I don't know what the future holds, but I'm being told that Andrea is gonna get on a Skype call with me and that's something to look forward to. And we're gonna talk about books. And now I've encountered you and my day is so much better. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I might read someone else and encounter lines that are just going to change my life. You never know what the day holds. And so artists, writers, the people engaging with artists and writers, those people are equally important because without each other, there is nothing. Yeah. So thank you for making this time as well. And all the best with all of your reading and everything else. Yeah.